All right, the last time I saw Glenn Kirshner, we were together drinking in a bar in Midtown, and what a great time. I had such a fun time with you. Thank you so much for pulling me out of the shed. Yeah, and there might be some uh, video evidence of me kissing your bald head. I'm not, that may have been Photoshopped. I'm not entirely sure. I actually uh, have a screen grab of that framed in the shed with lipstick on it. I don't know what that's about, but uh, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> it was so much fun. Uh, thank you for joining me. I have a, a lot of criminal justice questions for you. And, I, and, and as it relates to like trying to, a, a kid as an adult from, from Rittenhouse out there, he's 17, this vigilante who just got off. And then you got the kid in Michigan who, who took four teenagers lives, shot a bunch of others. And now his parents are in trouble. And there's this question about how you can try a young person as an adult and how that works. And the it's it's it to me it's pretty clear cut and dry. I don't know anything about what the law says, but morally it seems like a kid is a kid, no matter what horrible things they think or do or say. At some point, you know, they're just a kid being influenced, or maybe they've got some kind of illness. How do how does the law look at it? How do we look at this morally? Yeah, so the trend has actually been to be more lenient on juvenile offenders, because the more we learn about brain chemistry, we learn about just how susceptible to influence and peer pressure and, and susceptible to, you know, having poor impulse control children are. Um, but you have to balance public safety against all of those, I think, good natured urges and empathetic urges we have to treat children as children all the time and understand that they're going to do things that they, they shouldn't do. Um, so here's how a very broad brush picture. If you are 18 and older, you're generally charged as an adult. If you're 17 or younger, different jurisdictions handle that the, the crimes committed by juveniles differently. Let me use D.C. because we have lots of examples to, to choose from when it comes to juvenile offenders. In DC, if you're 16 or 17 years old and you commit certain, let's just say crimes of violence, certain statutorily designated crimes, you can be taken as an adult with just the prosecutor signing your arrest warrant in a certain way. It's called the Title 16 Adult Certification. So when I was chief of homicide, if I had a 16 or 17 year old defendant who'd committed a murder and I had probable cause to support an arrest warrant, I had to decide whether that, sh that kid should be handled in the adult system or the juvenile system. And a lot of factors went into that. But, you know, as much as you understand why young people, you know, impulsively commit crime, you also have to understand that when violent crime is being committed in the community, you know, it doesn't matter to you if your loved one was killed by an a 16-year-old, a 26-year-old, or an 86 year old. Public safety is public safety. So there is always a balance that goes into these decisions. I had a 15 year old kid, Pete, who committed three murders, all at age 15, in three separate incidents. We decided at age 15, you can try to certify somebody as an adult. It takes about two years. You have an entire trial on the question of whether that juvenile offender is susceptible to rehabilitation. And if you can prove to a judge's satisfaction that he is not, then he can be certified as an adult, even though he committed the crimes at 15. I did that once in my 30 years as a prosecutor, and that 15-year-old was certified as an adult. So, but the question is about <clears throat> public safety, and that's a fair question. You don't care if the if the murderer, someone takes your, your family member is a 15-year-old or an 18-year-old, you don't care. But the the I think I guess what I'm what I'm missing is the reason why you try them as an adult is because that's the only way they can be sentenced to jail time for a longer period of time. If you try them as a juvenile, that means they're going to get out in a certain amount of time. Like what what am I missing? You can only confine them until they're 22 years old. So through their 21st year, if you're a juvenile and you commit a murder at age, let's say, 14, 15, 16, and you're run through the juvenile system in DC, you can only be detained while you're 21 years old. 22, you're gonna be put out. So it's a relatively short period of in incarceration and incapacitation, and then the person's going right back out into the community. 
is there not a way to stipulate a different law? I mean, psychologically, morally, does it, it would seem like, you know, if a kid killed four of his, his schoolmates at 15, he's 15. Do you have any idea what he was doing? His parents got him that gun and, and maybe he stays in prison until 22. It's seven years. And, and now he knows he's a completely different person that, than he was. And I mean, maybe they reevaluate him. It seems wrong. Yeah, it, it seems wrong, but it can only be changed by the legislature because each state has its own laws regarding how they um, deal with juvenile offenders. So well, 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 if, if there's a public uprising, you go to your legislature and have them, you know, enact more stringent laws to make sure that, you know, we take into account the, the youth of the offender, but we also take into account public safety. Well, knowing what little you know about this kid in Michigan and and his family, which we know probably a little bit more than we know most of these situations in terms of his parents and things that were written, uh, and, and you've been following this closely. How would you approach this this case? Well, it sounds like under the laws of Michigan, don't quote me on this, but I think he's being treated as an adult offender. Yeah. Um, that's so that means he will be subject to up to 15 years um, confinement on each of the four counts of murder. And then I think there were seven counts of aggravated assault or attempted murder for the seven students that he injured, but but they survived. Um, so I, I think he will be facing an adult sentence. And I am actually thrilled, that's probably not the right word to use, that the district attorney believed there was enough evidence to bring criminal charges against the parents for their gross negligence slash recklessness in giving their 15-year-old troubled, volatile son a gun. And then what was worse? Because you know what? Listen, Michigan, they like their hunting. Lots of states, they like their hunting. And yeah. juveniles can possess guns lawfully for purposes of hunting or otherwise in Michigan. But, you know, parents have to be responsible about it. Not only did they give their son a gun with lots of indication that he was a troubled young man, but when a teacher saw him searching online to purchase ammunition and was so concerned that the teacher reached out to the parents the mother texted the son, LOL, I'm not mad at you. You just have to learn not to get caught. I mean, that screams the kind of gross negligence and recklessness that does support involuntary manslaughter charges for the parents. Why? Because they were grossly negligent or reckless, because their recklessness was reasonably likely to result in death or serious bodily injury to another, and that their recklessness thereby caused the death, which means their recklessness was a substantial factor in their son being in a position to kill people. So I am glad these charges are being brought against the parents. Okay, let's talk about a couple of other. Well, by the way, what is it? What is juvenile detention like? My daughter, my younger daughter, was asking me about that. The differences between an adult prison and, and juvenile detention. I mean, is it? I, I try to, I, I was, I go, I don't know, Jewel, but I think, I, I would think that the juvenile detention is a, is more humane somehow, um, less punitive, maybe more comfortable somehow, less, less um, gangs or, or corruption from corrections. I don't know. I have no idea. Can you tell me? Yeah, Anything? there is a somewhat infamous facility in DC called Oak Hill, Oak Hill Juvenile Detention Facility. And when I was a prosecutor, the nightmare stories that coming out of Oak Hill um, were just pretty horrific. Because think about it, if you have kids, you know, many of whom are raised in the street and don't have a lot of impulse control, don't have a lot of, um, uh, haven't had the kind of upbringing that instills in them the importance of obeying rules, being law-abiding, having empathy for other human beings, um, and then you put them all in a confined facility together, you have, you know, these kids act up, they lash out at each other. There's a lot of violence. The guards then have to take care of it. Some of the guards, you know, misbehave themselves in the way they treat the kids. So juvenile detention facilities, you would like to think are more humane and, and, and environments that are easier to control than adult uh, detention facilities. But that, that's really not the case. And will you give me one example? I mean, is that endemic? I don't know. I can't speak. I don't want to speak for other jurisdictions. I know what I know in D.C. I know had I'm enormous problems in their juvenile 
detention facilities. If you know anybody that, that deals in those facilities, and if anybody listening knows anybody, I, I'd like to learn more about it. Let's talk about Jeffrey Clark. You made a video about this character, uh, and he is a character in, in the saga of our Shakespearean-like tragedy that has become uh, Trump's America and all of the aftermath of of his presidency in January 6th. Who is, who is Jeffrey Clark and why is he, he's been subpoenaed and he apparently is, is, is pleading the fifth, which never, which never, it's not great branding. (laughs) No. So Jeffrey Clark was one of Trump's high government officials in the department of justice. And when Donald Trump was told by his DOJ officials, Mr. President, there is no fraud undermining the presidential election results. Donald Trump said, doesn't matter. Just say there was fraud and leave the rest up to me and my associates in Congress. Jeff Clark, one of his high DOJ officials, took him up on it and joined Donald Trump's conspiracy, went back to the Department of Justice and drafted letters to the battleground states. We've seen the letter that he drafted to Georgia state election officials, giving them a blueprint how to corruptly overturn the presidential election results in Georgia. Right there, Pete, you have a conspiracy and you have what's called an overt act. Jeff Clark did one thing toward the commission of the underlying crime. So you bet Jeff Clark has a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination all day long, because if he testified truthfully, he would be telling us about the crimes against the United States he committed. Now, the way he has gotten to invoking his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination is, is pretty absurd. You know, you would think he would be smarter than he is as a lawyer. Um, because first, he walked into the select committee on the day he was subpoenaed with a lot of bluff and bluster, refused to answer any questions, and then he stormed out, which is not complying with a subpoena. It's still contempt because you didn't comply with a subpoena. Then he announced, well, you know what? I'm going to invoke my fifth next time I I show up. Then he announced, now I have a bellyache, so I need to, I need to put it off in the future. I don't know if, if next it's going to be the dog ate my subpoena. I have no idea. <laughs> but, but what I do know is here's why this is such a staggering development. When a Department of Justice official, this guy was the head of the environmental division and the acting head of the civil division, and the civil division is a huge operation at DOJ. When that guy commits crimes against the United States such that he has to invoke his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, that signals that the Department of Justice must, must criminally investigate Jeff Clark. Hmm. And when DOJ has to criminally investigate one of its own, you know what that means? That means they have to interview and present to the grand jury probably dozens and dozens of DOJ officials, employees, prosecutors, all the people around Jeff Clark when he was committing these crimes against the United States. That screams conflict, and it's the kind of conflict that moves us in the direction of a special counsel being appointed. Well, to be clear, apparently, so the the House Committee investigating January 6th, Capitol insurrection postponed deposition on Saturday due to, quote, medical condition that precludes his participation. Apparently. Bellyache. It's a bellyache. It's a be- what do you call that in the business? Um, I you know, listen, I, I don't want to make if the man has a legitimate medical condition that but, you know, after you've had a couple of other false starts, it, right. it begins to feel suspect. But I did see Adam Schiff say, listen, we got verification that he's got some medical condition, so we're going to reschedule him. Um, I don't I don't know if it was diabetes or something else he's suffering he, from. But. Maybe he swallowed a jar of pills to get out of it. I mean, there could be any number of things, I suppose. But that I mean, what does that mean? I mean, this, isn't he in the same boat then as Bannon and, and Mark Meadows? And by the way, I, 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 I now challenge you if, if Bannon ever sees justice then I will sit on your lap during the taping of a YouTube video and eat my hat uh, live on one of your videos. And I'll win in the end because I'll get more followers, but I too will have a tummy ache from eating eating my hat. I think Bannon's going to prison. Bannon's going to prison. Here's why. Here's why, Pete. He has no defense. He has no defense to the crime of uh, contempt of Congress, and he's been charged with two counts. He will be convicted, right? Can you agree that if you got no defense and the prosecutors take him to trial, he's going to trial, he will be convicted. The law 
says there's a mandatory minimum sentence and it's only 30 days on each count that the judge has no discretion. The judge must impose at least 60 days in prison and can impose as much as two years in prison. He will go to prison unless he pleads guilty and agrees to cooperate. Then they can go below that mandatory minimum sentence. Well, he wants to go to, he will love going to prison for 30 days. He will. He will, because he's using it as a fundraising, you know, vehicle. Right. Yeah, he'll do he'll do his show from the prison war room. I mean, yes. OK, so uh, maybe I won't be eating my hat, I guess, because he's going to he wants to go to prison because it's good for his his dumb show that he's so powerful. My Lord, is he powerful? I mean, he stole from Donald Trump's base with the bogus We Build the Wall Foundation. And then Donald Trump pardoned him. I mean, how how much more disrespectful can you be to your own voters? Oh, God. Uh, I, yeah, I just get so much PTSD when thinking about the guy. All right. How how about yesterday on Fox? Was it? No. Who was he talking to? Uh, a Mark Lee on Fox News when Trump didn't Trump uh, obstruct justice again. Like, didn't he admit like has he admitted over and over to obstructing justice? And how do you react to everybody flipping out last night saying he did it again? He admitted to a crime live on television when he said I had a fire coming. I had fire coming. He's going to come for me. Yeah, this is old news. He already he already made that particular confession previously, I think, to Lester Holt. So this is him just being emboldened because he hasn't been held accountable. And I try to beat back my own frustration, Pete, because charges should have been brought on January 21st as a result of the, the Mueller investigation. Um, and they haven't been. And I still believe that our friends of the Department of Justice, my former colleagues, are working on holding Trump and company accountable. I don't believe for a minute, Pete, not for a minute, that they're just sitting back saying, we're prepared to give it all away to Donald Trump. We're ready to let him bring an end to our democracy. I don't believe it for a minute. And here's the thing, people point to Adam Schiff, right? Adam Schiff keeps saying, I see no indication that the Department of Justice yeah. is criminally investigating right. Donald Trump. Let me first say, I take everything Adam Schiff says to the bank. I just do because of the man he is and the job he has done trying to save our democracy. But Pete, members of Congress and their staff are targets of the investigation, the insurrection. We know some members of Congress are complicit. We saw it, right? So, and I'm not saying Adam Schiff is one of those people, but what you don't want to do if you're the Department of Justice and you're investigating members of Congress and their staff is breathe a word of it to anybody in Congress. So I'm not surprised Adam Schiff isn't being read in formally or informally about what's going on behind those big metal DOJ doors. Well, I don't know if I share your optimism, but I certainly hope you're right. I certainly hope you're right about that because what else do we have? We got nothing. If we don't have that, we got nothing. Right. Well, well, we've got Georgia. We've got the uh, the the Manhattan. Yeah, we got New York. We got Georgia. We got DOJ. It's not exactly a tortoise and a hare thing. It's like a tortoise and a sloth and a snail. It's like yeah. who is gonna get off the dime and charge this guy? Uh, all right, man. Well, I appreciate you updating me. I've been watching all the videos that you're posting, of course, on YouTube. Uh, keep it coming, buddy. I appreciate it very much. Great being with you, Pete. Thank you.